Greetings and welcome to The Movement with Kemet Shockley and Kofi Lanyles. Thank you for joining us. This show highlights the most important voices in the current black movement for social justice. This is a chance for us to learn from the most insightful and impactful leaders in the community. Welcome to The Movement with Kemet and Kofi. Today we're here with Mr. Tariq Nasheed, who is known for his mega hit series, Hidden Colors, a documentary about black history. We're also here with Dr. Afia Mbili Shaka, who is a professor and psychologist studying psychotherapy. Dr. Mbili Shaka was recently featured on Good Morning America to discuss her research around black identity. Tariq and Afia, welcome to the movement. It's my Thank pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Tariq Nasheed, yes, Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, mm -hmm. Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, and a host of other African-Americans laying in the street dead for absolutely no reason. A few years ago, you contextualized the underlying problem this way. Deflect into what's wrong with the black community. And we never talk about the real issue of racism and the real thing that drives racism, which is systematic white supremacy. And that's something that's never even spoken about publicly. It used to be much less popular than it is now to use the phrase systematic white supremacy. Help us understand, what is systematic white supremacy? What is white supremacy? And what does that have to do with what's happening to black people now? It's a system that guarantees benefits and privileges based on race, and it also guarantees detrimental um, treatment and mistreatment based on race. So white people are guaranteed certain privileges and benefits, and black people are guaranteed to be mistreated and systematic deprivation. So we have to always put it in the context of a system, and there are many people who operate this system. We think white supremacy is just an extremist group, a few guys walking around with hoods, a few guys walking around with swastikas, and white supremacy, the system of it is deeper than that. It's the, the local librarian, it's the, the local politician, it's the congressman, it's the, the person at the store, it's the person at the school. They operate in conjunction and they operate on codes with each other. And the, they get these codes through osmosis. So it's very hard to detect who exactly is a white supremacist. And this is why it's been so hard to replace the system of white supremacy with the system of justice, because now nobody's admitting to being a white supremacist. Before, the people in this country were very proud to say that they were white supremacists. That's their term. They created the term white supremacy and drilled it into us. Now that we're giving them their term back, they're saying, hey, don't say that now. All racism matters. So if that's the case, then why do we have people going around saying things like this? White supremacy and white nationalism is nowhere near, ranks nowhere near the top of the issues that are facing black America. Considering what Candace Owens said, what's your response to that? You no, know, in any type of system of tyranny, any type of system of blatant white supremacy, there's always been collaborators with the white supremacist structure. You can see that in Nazi Germany. They had Jewish people like Rumkowski, who was a very well-known collaborator mm -hmm. with the Jewish, with the, with the Nazis who helped round up Jewish people and take them to the concentration camps. He was ultimately taken to the concentration camp himself. Mm -hmm. So people get desperate and they do desperate things. Mm -hmm. So they get people like Candace Owens and they turn her into a collaborator with the white supremacist system. They elevate her to some type of spokesperson status. Candace Owens is only known for getting pushed into the limelight to talk negatively about black people. There's another context to that as well. White supremacy is a global plantation. The earth has been turned into a plantation. All of Africa and Caribbean nations, those are the fields. America is the, the big house. And a lot of folks who are in the field, they want to get in the big house. So they'll collaborate with the white supremacist masters to get in the big house. So they will do certain things to undermine the black people who are in the big house, which is us. Now, let's look at it in the context of slavery. Most of the runaways in slavery were people working in the house because they were right there under white supremacy and they saw how detrimental and how demonic it was and there was nowhere else to go. You couldn't go no, the only thing was freedom. So if you look at slave narratives, the runaways were the ones in the house. We are the ones, foundation of black Americans, we fight white supremacy tooth and nail. But you have other groups who wanna come in because they've been deprived of resources in their homeland. 
So they just want to get into a comfortable zone in the big house and almost replace us to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. So they will systematically go get Caribbeans. Candace Owens is Caribbean. A lot of people don't know that. And she identifies with being Caribbean. Most of the people that are the blacks for Trump folks, most of them are West African immigrants or Caribbean immigrants. Many of them are Jamaican. And that's deliberate because white supremacists, they're very scientific and they know how to strategically use black people against each other. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Mbili Shaka, you hear this, uh, that what Tariq Nasheed is saying is that we are beset with almost a violent, just vile brand of white supremacy. But yet you have what Candace Owens just said at the same time. <laughs> Are we experiencing more of sort of like a, what we used to have in the 1960s with COINTELPRO as this intentional discord in the community in terms of what everybody is thinking? Or do we have sort of just uh, genuine disagreement? What, what do you say? Well, there are a variety of ways to interpret her behavior and the behavior of other people that, that have been pawns in the system of white supremacy or victims of it. Um, I think that, that there needs to be group group cohesiveness as a way to address um, white supremacy. But I think that, that one of the greatest attacks of black people is creating discord. Mm. And so um, when we don't have a collective identity, that it can sicken us. We are a clan people, a tribal people, uh, we work in groups. Mm. And so having these voices of sickness mm. um, can actually infect other people then too. I want to share a James Baldwin clip from more than 40 years ago and then follow it up with a question for the both of you. When I left this country in 1948, I left this country for one reason only, one reason. I didn't care where I went. I might have gone to Hong Kong, I might have gone to Timbuktu, I ended up in Paris, on the streets of Paris, with $40 in my pocket on the theory that nothing worse could happen to me there than it already happened to me here. More and more, I'm hearing black people, especially millennials, say, you know what? The U.S. isn't for black people. I'm moving back to Africa. And this year, the Exodus Alliance, seen here, started a $1 billion campaign to help Africans across the diaspora repatriate to the continent. Dr. Mbili Shaka, can you tell us why you believe more black people are giving up on the American dream and instead choosing an African dream? I think that a lot of black millennials in particular are looking for a space to be whole and complete and not under terrorism and attack. Now, there is a universal context of racism, but there's more of a feeling of safety when you're surrounded by people who look like you and who can actually communicate with you and don't see you as um, less than human. I think that, that when I've traveled around the world, where I have felt the most myself, and human is on the African continent. That, that I don't have to think about certain issues or have to be worried about how someone could misinterpret a behavior or a saying. Um, and I feel like that, that I'm within community. Now I'm mindful that there is, you know, there are systems and it's a global plantation, but in certain spaces, I feel more myself, um, my true black and African self. Now Tariq Nasheed, you've advanced the idea that black people are foundational to the United States. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't necessarily advocate for repatriation. Absolutely not, because we've been here for half a millennium and we are foundational black Americans. We are our own ethnic group. The nations that were in Africa when certain of relatives of ours left aren't even there anymore. Africa is a completely different place. It has completely different cultures since we had our ancestors there. We have a mix of black people from Africa and aboriginal black people here that are mixed together to create what we have foundational black Americans now. This is why they named us Negro, different from Africans, because they understood what an African was, they understood what a Moor was. They understood putting the two groups together with the um, native people here, that's a different ethnic group. So I'm not gonna repatriate because we built this land, we built the West, the wealth of the Western, um, well, not the Western world, but just the wealth of the world, period. Foundational black Americans built the United States. We were not brought to the United States. We didn't immigrate to the United States. There was no United States until foundational black Americans built it. And I come from that stock of Harriet Tubman, Denmark, VC, 
um, Prosser, all of those people, they didn't run and I'm not going to run. Africa is overrun with white supremacy. The reason why Africa is devastated economically is because of the white supremacists orchestrating that. That's why when you go to African nations, there's a line at the embassy where people are trying to get passports to get over here. So white supremacy is global. We as foundational black Americans know we're going to have to fight that thing head on and I have no problem doing that at all. So what does creating a peaceful environment look like for black people in the United States since you're advocating that black people stay here and create a peaceful existence here? Well, you can have a peaceful existence if people are as acting unpeaceful to you. If people are waging war on you, you have to be in a position and a mindset to protect yourself. We can't pray our way out of it. We can't kumbaya our way out of it. You're gonna have to stand up to some of the tyranny that's going on and that's just the way it's gonna have to be. Foundation of Black Americans, when we got here, when we first became an ethnic group, and I trace it back to 1526, when the Spanish brought over black people who were enslaved in, um, in, in Spain, there was a big slave rebellion here where they ran the Spanish out of here. We've always fought white supremacy on this land. Our history is about us fighting them and us trying to maintain our human beingness. So we did it then and we can do it now. And we have to replace the system of white supremacy with a system of justice. Going from one place to another, that's not going to solve the problem. We have to deal with the injustice of white supremacy. Dr. Mbili Shaka, any response to that? I think that it's very challenging to practice African culture in the United States because the very nature of its founding is anti-African. And so I, I'm just thinking about how to have a holistic and um, healthy black and African identity that the environment does matter. Um, and so I, I come from a very strong lineage, but I understand that my ancestors that were enslaved in the United States are from Africa. And so that that is my home um, versus a place in which I was captured and forced to um, adapt. And even though some of our people were from Africa, we were mixed in with the Aboriginal people here. We have to understand that we were here, many of our ancestors were here before Columbus. We're taught that the Native American people are these Indian looking people with long hair that looks like weaves. Some of the Aboriginal people here look just like us. You go down and see the Olmec statues, you go to California, the Ohlone Indians, the Mojave Indians, I'm talking about jet black people, all on this Eastern seaboard, jet black people. So we were mixed in with the brothers and sisters is brought over from the diaspora. In the 1920s, William Plecker, the white man who worked at the Vital Statistics Office, he went out of his way, he was a white supremacist, he went out of his way to erase the records of black people who were Native American and they just reclassified everybody as Negro. This went on into the 1960s. The case with Loving versus the state of Virginia is based on the ruling that he put together. The one drop rule was really not just for white people. The one drop rule was to stop us from claiming our native Aboriginal status. Mildred Loving, the woman who's a part of that case, she's actually Native American. She was reclassified as Negro. So this is a piece of our history that's not told to us because we're taught that we're comparative to immigrants and foreigners and we are not. So we have to understand this is our land. I'm mindful that I have tons of European blood, right? Oh yeah, but yeah, that's yeah. not my space. I would, I don't want to claim that. Mm -hmm. And so I do identify too with my indigenous background here in the United States. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I'm very, very mindful about the culture, right, that I'm operating from and practicing, and the resources that are associated with that culture, mm -hmm. and just even whether it's the the, the land itself in the relationship um, to which my phenotype and genetics developed, right? Whether the classification process, which is a social construction, right? Mm -hmm. When looking at history and how the census, you know, categorizes people from, from a very white supremacist ideology and purpose, mm -hmm. I can recognize that I, ha I have a range of ancestry. But I think, again, going to that concept of culture, I'm attracted to African culture because I'm African. And so um, whether it's a percentage, I took African ancestry tests, I, oh, but I'm very mindful that, that um, again, that in order for me to have an identity, I need to have an origin story. Mm -hmm. And I do identify the origin story of everyone in the planet from Africa. And so I think that that helps me to center myself. So I'm just even thinking about, about of course, I, I have been here my whole life, right? I've never lived in Africa. And I think there are certain benefits that can be afforded to people as they navigate 
and um, transition throughout the globe. So I think there are benefits to, to understanding connections to environments mm -hmm. um, versus connections to trauma environments too. So of course there's trauma on the African continent, tons, you know, centuries in, in these pieces, but I'm just very mindful, very mindful of, of where um, my origin story begins. And what I don't want black folks to get into and white people who are controlling the education system and the media system too, they Wakandaize our history. <laughs> See, they create this Wakanda civilization that we long for and it's not, it, that doesn't exist anymore. That's just, that's the reality of it. And we have to recognize foundational black Americans' uniqueness. Yes. We are very exceptional people who are different from other groups. We're the only group that built a nation from scratch. We're the only group who protected this country in every single war. We're the only group who created holidays like Memorial Day. We were the ones who created Memorial Day, memorializing the people who fought in the Civil War. That's another thing. We fought in these wars like the Civil War to free ourselves. We weren't just sitting around waiting on white mommy and daddy to free us. The Seminoles were fighting a guerrilla warfare. We fought in the Civil War. We've always maintained the integrity of this country. We created music and cultures from scratch. We created foods and recipes from scratch. We've done so many things. We created languages from scratch. So we are, we are the culture culture of this nation, we're the moral fiber of this nation, and that's the thing that keeps this nation together, and that's the thing that makes this nation great, is the moral fiber that we put down. This is why when you think of black people, you think of foundational black Americans. You think of Muhammad Ali, you think of Dr. Martin Luther King, you think of Rosa Parks, you think of Ida B. Wells, you think of foundational black Americans because we've been the moral fiber of the planet, if you want to go there. But that's no disrespect to our brothers and sisters in Africa. I go to Africa all the time and I got a lot of love for them we have a lot of respect for them but we just understand our own unique ethnic group as foundational black Americans. Tariq Nasheed you just said something that's very interesting is in terms of looking at pan-Africanism mm -hmm. this idea of all African people being a unified group it's, and th things of that nature. Yeah. Um, is that a place we're trying to get to or do we not try to get there uh, how do you think about that? That's a very good question. You know what, we were, as foundational black Americans, we were going there and it was working for us for a minute and the white supremacists got in front of that. Black people, we recognized our universality. We understood that we're all the same as black people. We would want to connect with other black people around the world so that they could be reinforcements for us. And for a time, they were reinforcements. Marcus Garvey was a reinforcement for us. Stokely Carmichael, who's Caribbean, that was a reinforcement for us. Schomburg, Puerto Rico, that was a reinforcement. In the 1960s, the white supremacists understood, okay, we can't have these black folks becoming international. We can't have them hooking up with other black people around the world because they're gonna undermine us. So they would go to these nations and they would find coons and they would cultivate their own coons in these nations and then start sending the Candace Owens and all of these people over here to undermine us. So we got this thing, we're all black, we're all black, and we'll let in the Candace Owens and we don't know that she's undermining us under the table. And this is what's been going on now. We got this thing where we're all, not only black people, but we're all people of color. Remember in the 60s and the early 70s, we welcomed all groups, all the Asian groups, Bruce Lee, we love you, Bruce Lee. Chinese movies, come on. Karate movies, come on. Um, liquor store, Asian liquor, come on. <laughs> All of that stuff was built on our backs. But ultimately, later on down the line, you see these people started to kind of undermine and turn on us, and everything started to work against us. So we have to not just open the door to be kumbaya, kumbaya for everybody, because that will be used against us at one point. So we have to understand, we have to look out for resources for ourselves as our own distinct group, so we don't get exploited. So, so let me ask you this. Yes. You mentioned coons. Yes. So <laughs> what is a coon yes. and is there a difference between a coon from Africa and the Caribbean and a coon who is a foundational black Good American? Good question. Good question. A coon is someone who deliberately undermines black people to get um, minor benefits from the dominant society. That's a person who you have to be deliberate to be a coon. Coons know what they're doing and foreign coons and domestic coons are different. Domestic coons that we have. <laughs> We, we, this is deep, this is deep. The domestic coons are more buffoonish and cartoonish. 
because they understand they can't walk among us, so there's only so far they can go with the coon. They're like diamond and silk. They're more buffoonish. Even white people don't take them seriously. You understand? Jesse Lee Peterson, he's more of a buffoon. White people don't even take him seriously. He's more of a caricature. But the Candace Owens and people like that, they're a little more sinister because they intellectualize that stuff. They put them people on panels to talk about reparations, you see? They have them in Senate hearings like they had on that video. So they put them in serious discussions where they work with these white right-wing think tanks to give them talking points to deliberately undermine us. So they're a little more insidious. So that's the difference. Dr. Billy Shaka, I'm concerned about not having Pan-Africanism yeah. because I think that the idea of, of black people trying to solve their problems together is, 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 is a good idea. Um, but you, we hear what Tariq Nasheed is saying, that the, the idea of undermining. Um, what, what, what is your response to the notion that there are groups that may be undermining uh, African-American efforts, but we also definitely, and I hear you talking, I know that you, you're, you like the idea of Pan-Africanism as well. I don't like it. How, how, do we, how do we reconcile some of that? Well, I think that we need to centralize one of the major goals of white supremacy being genocide of African people, that, that if we are to continue to exist, um, that I think that we need to, to understand that this is about our survival. Mm. And so even if maybe we're not speaking the same languages or eating the same foods or listening to the same music, that there still is something connected to us in terms of our genes. Mm. And so that, that you know, um, we have to recognize that, that using the coon, the, whatever the sort of the, the American or the Caribbean coon is, is still, seeing that person as part of white genetic survival, right? That they need these black voices to protect them, right? Because if they don't have that protection amongst black people, that, that they are a global minority. And so to recognize that we can step into power, access our resources through this collective effort in terms of thinking about where the greatest amount of resources are on the planet and to be able to protect those resources and um, utilize power to protect those that I think that it involves a group cohesiveness. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the major impacts of colonialism and enslavement was to destroy that co group cohesiveness mm -hmm. to, um, in terms of the involuntary migration of African people, but how to reconnect um, through, through this agenda of survival. So I'm just thinking about on a very genetic level, mm -hmm. um, how Pan-Africanism um, functions and why. The um, thing is, Pan-Africanism, unfortunately, for the last, I would say 50 years, it's been very one-sided. <laughs> um, in the 1960s, our people, man, we, not only were we fighting for our civil rights here, we were fighting for immigration rights. We really sacrificed a lot to get those immigration laws passed, so now, I see a lot of people from immigrant families, especially Nigeria, places like that, who say that they get the talk. And the talk is, before they immigrate here, when you get to America, you stay away from the Akata. You stay away from them blacks. They're all gang members, and they'll get you pregnant, and they're gonna do all this stuff. So they get all these stereotypes, and we're welcoming these people thinking, okay, these are our brothers and sisters, and they're looking at me as an Akata, and we, that's not gonna work for us. So we have to understand when people are coming over and they're gonna be genuine allies or they're just gonna come over and use the resources. We're Akatas, but you're using all of the DACA programs, which is the Dreamer program named after Foundation of Black American and the Lift program based on Lift Every Voice. All of these programs with these Foundation of Black American connotations, you benefit off of the labor and the work and the efforts of Foundation of Black Americans, yet you have contempt. So we're gonna to have to stop that contempt game and put, make everybody put respect on our name. I was recently in the Bahamas. Yes. <clears throat> and I was talking to some uh, black people in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. And they said that there are African Americans who come there who treat them as less than. Mm. Right? Mm. Uh, so I'm wondering if we were to talk to our brothers and sisters in Bahamas and in other parts of the Caribbean and Africa, and they share those kinds of stories. What is, it, what is your response to a notion that African Americans also may exhibit some coonery when they visit other countries. I can imagine some people, maybe in a hotel setting or a tourist setting who might be rude. We don't have 
our version of Candace Owens going over to an African nation, getting into their political business, telling them what they are not supposed to get. We don't have that. We don't have um, our version of Jesse Lee Peterson going to Jamaica, telling people they shouldn't get reparations. See, we get immigrants coming over here from Africa and the Caribbean telling us what we shouldn't get after they benefit from some of the resources that we have. But we don't have that on the flip side. So again, there might be situations of individual rudeness, but as far as a whole network of people like they have over here who will try to undermine us, we don't do that to them. As a matter of fact, when we go to Caribbean nations and African nations, as you guys have displayed, we show respect. We go there and we revere these nations. Even though we haven't lived there, we haven't lived there in 500 years, we still show respect to those African nations. I've given all types of money to African orphanages. I show respect and I get respect when I get over there. And John Henry Clark even talked about the Africans who play games when they come to the West. And that's, that's a part of it and we have to recognize that and not let that undermine us. Yeah, I'm just thinking about Dr. Clark as well in terms of um, just even identifying these historical movements where it included Africans from all over the globe collaborating, just even like for the Haitian Revolution, mm -hmm. having the Jamaican connection with the Haitian connection that is actually what allowed it to, to jump off. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just thinking about the power that, that happens when we have a centralized goal or agenda in terms of liberation of African people globally. But I'm just thinking too about the role of the media. For my, my mind is just going into the, this media in terms of how that shapes the images of Africans around the globe. So, you know, for Nigerian families, they're utilizing information that they saw in a movie or saw in a television show that are stereotypes about, you know, black Americans and just even how, how um, that's not authentic engagement with each other. And so I'm just imagining what it would look like, you know, pre, like you were saying, pre 1960s, what it actually looked like when they would have these pan African conferences in locations for people to gather and have conversation and build authentic relationships. Um, in terms of actually getting to know each other and being, that being the foundation for our, our collaboration. Absolutely. And the white supremacists, they know us. They know us. They know our spirit. <laughs> they, they, they know us. And this is why when it comes to foundational black Americans doing certain things, the dominant white society, they're very weary of it. For example, when they do slave movies, a lot of foundational black Americans, when they get on the set of these movies, and they go to these actual plantations, I've seen many black actors say they felt something. Some of them even freaked out. My man, James, John Amos from Roots, he had a breakdown on a plantation. Um, a few people who've done slave movies, they had breakdowns on these plantations. This is why I think they get a lot of English actors to play like, in these slave movies. Politicians, the white politicians, when it comes to putting black people in certain political positions, they go out of their way to go get somebody who's not a foundational black American. There was n not a coincidence they got Obama. He's not a foundational black American. It's not a coincidence they got Colin Powell. He's not a foundational black American. Eric Holder is not a foundational black American. So they do this stuff deliberately because they know black people on a subconscious level, on a spiritual level, we're going to look out for other foundational black Americans, but they know that a person who is of foreign descent might not have that same connection. So they can get that person and trust that they're not going to empower the rest of the group. So we have to look at it from that standpoint. So the only thing that leaves me thinking about is those brothers and sisters who are, who are in the Caribbean and who are in Africa, mm -hmm who might have a different mindset mm -hmm. than the ones who come to the United States, mm -hmm. hearing you speak and saying, but oh, wait a minute, I don't feel that way. And that's why they don't get allowed to come over here. But you, you see? So maybe the issue isn't, isn't our brothers and sisters from the continent but, but, and, and from uh, the Caribbean, but maybe the issue is those who are allowed to come. The here. ones who are allowed to come over, yeah. I have some of them. Yeah, some of them who are allowed to come over and they're allowed to come over and they immediately get put in prominent positions. That's by design. Who are they working with? Who's sponsoring them? Who are their people? What kind of connections do they have? See, the white supremacists, they know how to cultivate these people. They know how to look at their parents and deal with their parents and then raise the kids for them, knowing that those kids are gonna grow up to work with the white supremacists. They're very strategic on how they manipulate black people to work against each other. I'm thinking of conversations that I've had with people when I traveled to say South America mm -hmm. or even to the African continent and for those who say things like I see you as my brother mm -hmm. and, and they don't create that separation because we could I guess that's more of like a pan-African mindset mm -hmm. 
those types of people, when they travel to a place like the United States, does the mindset of identifying with me actually keep them from doing things like the Candace Owens, doing things like the Jesse Lee Petersons, because they understand that if we identify together, then I would actually be hurting you by, by positioning myself against you. Mm. So in those ways, do aspects of Pan-Africanism actually solve the problem of putting myself in a, sec a separate group saying, maybe I'm Jamaican, so I'm not like you, or I'm Haitian, so I'm not like you as a foundational black American, but instead saying we're all black, we're all moving in this direction together, so I should be on code with you mm -hmm. to address your issues in this country. Now, the thing is, we think like that. We think, because look, foundational black Americans, we dealt with slave owners differently. In, in South America and the Caribbean, the, the way the slave owners dealt with the people, they played little mind games on them. Um, the French would play this little Creole game, like, okay, you're not quite black, I'll call you Creole. The Spanish, when they would rape the African women, they would actually claim the children. That created a lot of confusion down in South American countries because they look at themselves, they'll call themselves Spanish. Hey, I'm Mestizo. Spanish. Yeah, I'm Mestizo, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm Morena, I'm all this. They have all these different shades mm -hmm. so they, because they believe that they're part of the Spanish family. Over here in, in, in America, the British made no bones about their distaste and dislike for all colors of black people. There is not a mulatto community in America. There's no Octoroon community in America, whereas in South America and the Caribbean, you have little communities of these Creoles, these little communities of these Mestizos, these little communities of Octoroons, all of these different racial communities. We're all just black, so we understand we're all the same. We're all gonna get treated the same. So we're welcoming all these other people thinking that they're gonna think like us, but when they get here, it's like, well, I'm, I'm a Creole, I'm not like him. I'm mixed, my mama's black, but my dad is Haitian, so I'm black, I'm, I'm mixed, but we're, you're jet black, so we got a lot of people who are confused about dealing with white supremacy because they bring over all of these color casts that's been beneficial in their homeland, but it doesn't work here. Because see, they get tangible things in these other nations with these little color casts. You get to, if you are not as dark, you get to own a business. So they actually get something out of it. We don't get nothing out of that stuff over here. We only do the color thing when it comes to dating and that's it. That's the only time it makes a difference. But as far as getting resources, light skin, dark skin means nothing. You get treated the same over here. And we recognize that. It makes me think of my niece asked me a question about a month ago and she said, what does it mean to be black? How, how can I understand who I am as a black person? Mm -hmm. If she asked you that question, Dr. and Billy Shaka, what would you tell her? What does it mean to be black? What is black identity? This is something I've been studying and why I chose to go to Howard in terms of really understanding that, that definition. <clears throat> the way that I understand black identity, it's an internalized and evolving narrative of self within a racial system, right? And, or um, it's the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are and who we're connected to and who, um, well, just, just thinking about the, the culture of race and racism and your relationship with it. Um, I don't think that uh, there's one universal answer to what being black is or what it means to have a black identity because of the range of phenotype, because of the range of life experiences, access to resources, languages. But I think that, that there is, um, again, a story. I, I operate from the story piece in terms of conceptualizing what identity is. It's answering, who am I? And in that answering, answering, if you say black, that it has lots of meaning. Now the meaning can shift depending on where you are, the, the timeline, the physical space. But um, if you just, uh, the, how old is your niece, you said? 15. 15, okay, I was like, if she was six, I would say one way, but 15. But yeah, answering the question of who am I and saying black has an implication about your history and it has an implication about your culture. So um, that it, it links you to a historical timeline and um, peop, a group of people. And that's a very interesting question because I always tell people, the dominant society, they have a concept where they deal with black people. It's the one big Negro concept where we treat it as one big Negro. And with black people, we get confused as to what blackness is because it can mean, like, that was a very good point, it can mean so many different things to different people. And unfortunately, that will leave 
us up to a lot of exploitation. This is why we came up with the designation foundational black American. So we can specifically explain what that means. That means a person who's black, who was part of the, uh, who survived the slave trade and who were the foundations of America. That's a very distinct um, classification. The problem now, you got a lot of people who are politically black and they're black when it's convenient. So they will come from another nation and they will identify with the other nation, but if they know they can get some benefits, they'll be black temporarily. And this doesn't, is just not relegated to people from other Caribbean and African nations. You got the Rachel Dolezals who can now say, well, I'm trans black because I can get some benefits out of it. I can go get a scholarship. I can go get a job at the NAACP. Not only her, there's a bunch of white women now who are going to the universities, getting jobs, teaching African-American studies, and they're falsely claiming black. So people are using blackness as a political strategy to get benefits and resources. So this is why we gotta cut all the nonsense out and start putting some definitions on who's who and who's what, and let's clear up all the smoke. This is an outstanding discussion. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to, I mean, I think it's really an important part of the movement and that's the identity piece and how do we want to deal with the internationalization issues that are going on because here we are in a country where lots of different black people are going to continue to come to the country. Many of them might be undermining, some of them might not be undermining but we also have black people who are from this country undermining and not undermining. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of things to straighten out. But I wanna, I wanna circle back to the movement itself and ask the two of you to take a quick look at a video that uh, was presented by Tamika Mallory. I just wanna get your opinions on some things that she had to say. What is happening in America is that white nationalism ideology is running wild. And the reason why buildings are burning is because this city, this state, would prefer preserving that white nationalism and that white supremacist mindset over arresting, charging, and helping to convict four officers who killed the black man. That is the reality of what we're dealing with. Right. This is not just a few cops doing things right. across the country. Right. This is not a good cop versus bad cop situation. This is Ahmaud Arbery being shot down by white men on the streets of Georgia. Right. Breonna Taylor being killed in her home. This is in New York City where we were until freedom. We were just in New York fighting the police officers who in the name of social distancing were damn near killing black young people on our streets. This is a coordinated activity happening right. across this nation. Right. And so we are in a state of emergency. So Tariq Nasheed, recently you've been advocating for black people to see themselves as a distinct group as we've been talking about here today. We saw the clip that Tamika Mallory, uh, you know, just speaking to us. Um, in terms of us being foundational black Americans, distinguishing ourselves from um, Caribbeans or Africans and things of that nature, first of all, do you think that it's a coordinated effort to what's happening to black people? And second, how does our vision of ourselves as foundational black Americans um, help us to deal with the issue of uh, the annihilation of black people. How does that vision do that? The white supremacists right now, their numbers are dwindling and they know that they're going to be a minority here in the United States within the next 20 years. They're already a global minority. White people are less than 10% of the global population. They understand when they get low numbers here, that's going to be a threat. They want to create an apartheid state. The problem is, black people in America, we have a history of fighting them. So they're trying to establish dominance over us now by creating a militaristic apartheid regime. So this is why we're seeing all of these random killings of black people all around the country that's just brazen and they're just being bold about it because they're trying to haze us to get us to break down and accept it and it's not working. So the problem is when they start bringing in other groups from other places, to work with them and try to undermine us, we have to understand who they are and who's working with the white supremacists and who cannot come into our circles. This is why we're looking at ourselves as our own distinct group so that we know who to connect with to fight the white supremacists. 
we are in a war with these people and we have to look at it as warfare and we have to see who's the collaborators and we have to look at the common denominator of the collaborators. And when I see that, most of the collaborators that I see with the white supremacists are people who want to replace us anyway. A lot of people come over from African and Caribbean nations, not all of them, but they want to be tethers. The movie Us was really about that, the tethers, the people coming in and replacing another group from outside. So there are people out here who don't mind seeing us getting killed because they're like, okay, we can come over and we can take their place and I'll be good to white mommy and white daddy. That's not all the African brothers and sisters, but there's a significant number. Again, that goes back to the Candace Owens and people like that who don't mind being under white supremacy. It's better than being in a village with no water. That's their mentality. So we try to reach out and we still want to reach out to brothers and sisters in the diaspora so that we can build up an economic base. Malcolm tried to do it in the 60s. People don't know that he was rejected by a lot of the African nations. They actually told Malcolm, hey Malcolm, we like you, we respect you, but we kind of have, we have our own problems. The Latino community did the same thing too. They told us, hey black people, our problem is not the Negro problem. So all of these groups turn their backs on us and we're still on this kumbaya thing. So we need to start looking out for ourselves and saying, okay, look, if y'all not trying to get on the bandwagon and fight these people, we'll do it on our own. We've done it before. We don't need no loose ends and people undermining us anyway. So this is why we're looking at our own distinct group. Dr. Billy Shaka, do you see what's happening as being a coordinated effort? Is this an intentional coordinated effort? Uh, these things that are happening to black people. And you can also talk about what you think about what uh, uh, Tariq Nasheed just said. Yeah, I, my, my attention is going to the quiet and calm conversations that happen in boardrooms and in offices that coordinate the effort, right? In terms of the policies and procedures and the very constitution and foundation of this country were, were done to coordinate the efforts in terms of thinking about who is enforcing um, these systems of white supremacy and even terrorizing then, right? We, we're talking about white supremacy, but we do also have to call it terrorism, white terrorism and global domination. And so to recognize that it is um, a coordinated effort that this is the agenda to have whites on the top. And so every system that exists in our daily lives are set to that agenda, whether it is law or, or as Dr. Welsing says, economic, entertainment, education, labor, law, politics, sex, religion, and war, everything has that coordinated effort to keep the, the current system, again, and to terrorize black people, not only in the United States, but globally in terms of the, yeah, just, just trying to, to make us statistically insignificant. Um, in terms of taking away um, bodies and taking away, away people that, that would um, revolt. And I, when I talk to my family, my family normally tells me, we just need to create the right policies. And if we create the right policies, we can get ourselves out of the situation that we're in. We can move towards justice. We can have a more, I guess, just in society built around equity and equality. Is policy the way to go? No, I don't think policy is the way to go because you got to have a code and you got to be able to enforce the policy. If you can't enforce the policy, you're just going to be in the same spot. Look, they already have policies in place. The Constitution, you're not supposed to be killing people in their homes. You're not supposed to shoot people in the back. The Constitution is supposed to protect you from that. You're not supposed to be racially targeted. The Constitution protects you from that. You have a Second Amendment. You're not supposed to be shot if you legally have a gun like Philando Castile. You're not supposed to be shot because of freedom of speech. A black person say, hey, I didn't do nothing. You get shot and nobody gets punished. So the policies are already there. They're just not being enforced. We have to have a code where we are able to enforce the policies that's on the books right now. And that comes with black people being on code with each other. That's the only thing that we haven't had in a long time is a code. Back in the 60s, um, before 1965, we were effective because we knew how to be on code to a certain degree. The bus boycotts was about us being on code. You, you understand? We all knew not to get on them buses. Nobody was gonna break that code. We'll carpool with each other and that shut the bus system down down in Alabama. So we got things done. This is when they started to flood everything with immigrant groups and all that. And these other groups who look like us, when it was time to boycott again, like, I'm, I know Negra, I'm not boycott. So, we, for a long time, we have not been able to get on code because we got all these different ethnic groups who look like us, but they feel, okay, I don't have to get on code with him because I'm different than him. So this is why we gotta, if we're gonna be a global African group,
let's be a global African group and everybody's treating us differently. And when we start saying, okay, look, if you want to treat us differently, we're going to look at ourselves and distinguish ourselves differently. Then people want to cry foul because they know that they've been riding our coattails. We've been doing the fighting for all these other groups. See, they look at Foundation of Black Americans as their military group because we're the only ones who will get out here and take it to the streets on a regular basis. The watch riots, the L.A. riots. We put in some work out here. Mm, I, I even want to follow up in terms of thinking about the policy piece that you know, the Constitution wasn't for black people. We weren't people. Mm -hmm. um, that, that it exclusively was to perpetuate a system of white supremacy. And so even, you know, thinking that, that there was a disconnect. I think, um, you know, we still have not addressed um, the consequences of our enslavement in this country and recognizing too that these, these bus boycotts or ways to, um, address rights were actually destructive to some de degree when it created integration, right? The, the loss of black cab companies or buses or these different things that I think that tr trying to um, live in accord with policy that was not made for us or, you know, explicitly not, you know, related to protecting black bodies, but to think about even further trying to get those rights that were, you know, just for even at a point white men i think there's challenges because then we lost the opportunity for the black schools that we had already the successful black banks the grocery stores right in the early 1900s there were over 3,000 black grocery stores now there are like three and so to even think about that the concept of integration being so destructive um, to us when we're thinking we're getting rights but it actually has greater um consequences too. I just even wanted to think about like who, you know, the policies are for, who enforces them, but then even once we do get certain rights, the consequences of, of getting those. And to, to build on that, in order to enforce policies as well, you got to have an economic base. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're, we're told to not be business owners, which is very important. And Claude Anderson has been trying to teach us the importance of owning businesses, being entrepreneurs. See, we're taught to go to college and just get out and do and get a good job somewhere. Um, we have to understand the power of having an economic base. And also, when we get an economic base, let's get that hater garbage out of our system. Because when we see a successful black person running a successful business, there's too many of us who will try to undermine that person. We start sounding like a damn white supremacist. How come he ain't giving me something for free? That type of nonsense. And we get that from the dominant society because they have this de facto boycott of black businesses. And again, they sabotage a lot of successful black businesses. Even today, there was a company down there in Texas, the turkey leg hut that the white people were all organizing against to try to get shut down because it was so successful. So we have to rally around our black successful business owners and support them and go out of our way to protect them. And this is how we can have policies um, that will protect the whole community. So Tariq Nasheed, you mentioned earlier the LA riots, mm -hmm. the Watts riots. Currently, there are people taking to the street and protesting. A lot of people would suggest that there's a movement happening right now. Yes, it is. Can you give me your definition of the movement? Well, the movement right now is people are getting on code against systematic white supremacy. White supremacy is on the march right now. It's becoming more blatant and violent. And there is a legitimate pushback from systematic white supremacy. And because black people are pushing back, this is forcing a lot of other people in the dominant society to push back as well. If you notice, there's a lot of white people in the streets fighting against white supremacy. And the reason why, they don't wanna be a part of the backlash that may come from the black people. Remember LA riots, let's go back there. LA riot, a lot of white people were getting pulled out of cars. A lot of white people's homes were getting run up into. They don't tell you about that part of the riot. So they don't wanna be a part of that backlash. A lot of white people wanna be on the right side of history and they wanna be out here fighting white supremacy. And what's interesting, any white person who fights against white supremacy, they're being falsely labeled as Antifa. Antifa's not a, an organization. That's an idea, that's a fighting anti-fascism. So if a white person who doesn't wanna go along with white supremacy, they're now being criminalized to a certain degree. So this is how insidious white supremacy is. And what's the relationship between your work and the movement? My work, I do a lot of 
grounds work work on the ground i work with a lot of different groups i i've gotten a lot of people out of jail a lot of black people who've been arrested unjustly um, for being out here fighting in the streets i've gotten folks out of jail i bail people out of jail i've done these movies which are taught in schools because our cultural game has to be on point so i've been on this thing heavy a lot of black centered schools around the country i've given money to them I've done a lot of anti-black racism work. I basically, and I hate to pat myself on the back, I've helped get the word white supremacy in the lexicon. I've been screaming that for the last decade in the media, and now people are catching on and saying the word white supremacy. Because for a long time, we were using these little vague terms like discrimination, racism, uh, mistreatment. No, we gotta call it what it is. We're dealing with white supremacy, and you have to replace that with justice. Thank you. And, and Dr. and Billy Shaka, we turn to you. Can you give us your definition of the movement? Well, as a psychologist, I'm thinking about people needing a release and to have direction. So I think that the movement right now is creating a group identity in terms of being against white supremacy. Um, I think that there's been so much repression related to oppression. And so I'm just thinking about how the movement is really an opportunity to get a release, um, to express anger collectively, and for it to be affirmed, um, to actually see how anger can um, impact your space, and even white guilt. Um, I think that, that it's an emotional movement, if that makes sense too, in terms of being able to articulate and express um, stories that were shut down um, and unable to be articulated or words being able to be used that, that it, there's been so much silence on black pain. And so I think that, that it's a healing movement um, in terms of actually having people see the depth of um, the consequences on an emotional level of white supremacy. Tariq Nasheed, if we follow your lead, uh, see ourselves as foundational black Americans, mm -hmm. and we have reached a point of justice and equality in the society, where do we see ourselves in your vision 10, 20 years from now? What does it look like? In, in my vision, I see black people being prosperous, black people having their own economic base, black people having their own education systems. Most importantly, I see black people having their own systems of protection because my job is to not change anybody's heart. You're not gonna do that. My job is to help protect black people from tyranny. I want people to know we don't have to have a pie in the sky ideology about what needs to be done. We can do very tangible things. There's four things that black people can do right now to help counter white supremacy and try to bring a semblance of justice because of the tyranny that's going on right now. Number one, we can get on code, all have a code and understand we're gonna do what works and not do what doesn't work. Being on code means people out here protesting, we need more of that because that brings us media attention. The second thing we need to do is create an economic base we gotta have money to handle anything we need to handle. The third thing we have to do, we have to have a military protection, meaning we have to be able to counter these white militia groups that's out here. We have to have our own guerrilla warfare warriors out here countering these groups as per the Constitution. The Constitution says that we can have militias, that includes us too. The fourth thing that we can do, and my brother talked about policy, let's do something with policy now. Insurance, in slavery, Many black people who were enslaved, white people didn't just come along killing them willy-nilly because they had a semblance of protection. Why? Because black people who were enslaved were insured. They were property, but they were insured. If white people were going around harming black people who were enslaved, the white people would have gotten in trouble by the insurance companies. All of the insurance companies got all their money from insuring black people. We can do right now, if black people went out here and got insurance policies, every black person, when black people got killed by the police, instead of taxpayers paying all of these settlements, because when Crump and all these people go get settlements, that's coming out of our money. The police pensions are not being touched. The union's money is not being touched. That's coming out of taxpayers' money. So we get the brunt of it. If insurance companies are getting the brunt of these payouts, they will come up with policies to punish those police agencies and those unions. One movement I'm doing now, I'm working with black insurance companies and black insurance licensed people to start getting black people insured to help counter this stuff. So we got to do real world things out here and we can get it done. We just got to be on code. Mm. 
When you say on code, are you talking about uh, Neely Fuller's United Independent Absolutely. That, yes, that Neely Fuller, the genius, said the only thing missing with us is a code. We just do not have a code, and that's what the code is all about. So if a black person wants to get on code, that's their starting point. And yes. Is Neely Fuller's piece there? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Excellent. Dr. Billy Shaka, if we look, uh, if we take everything you've said, if we uh, are practicing African culture and we go down the path you want us to go down in terms of living our lives in a re-Africanized state, what does that look like for us in 10, 20 years? Where, where does it look like? Where are we trying to get us to? Well, well, I like the code concept, but I think putting code with culture, right? Um, seeing that, that what did our ancestors do and taking the best of those pieces and implementing them into our daily lives in terms of the foods that we eat, the ways that we dress, the way that we relate to each other and having cohesiveness and actually having relationship enhancement skills, how to have quality connections with ourselves and other people and self-respect um, and just really being able to unpack um, and understand systems that exist that shape our lives. So I'm, I'm still enjoying the, the concept of the economic systems and all, the, all these others that, that are uh, proposed. And so I'm just seeing us actually being African. Um, you know, not the current concept. And I'm not trying to fantasize what, you know, ancient societies or even Wakanda looks like, right? But, but to have an identity shift because I definitely think we've been in an identity crisis. And so to have a very clear concept of who am I? Am I who I say I am? Am I all I ought to be? So that's France Fanon, but just having clarity of identity and sense of self, I think is the ideal future <laughs> time. And so, so being your most authentic. You mentioned France Fanon, are there, is there a resource that you would point people to that would be a good starting point for anybody who is trying to get on track to get us where we need maybe, to be. Maybe an intro to France Renan using media would be concerning violence. Um, so the film narrated by um, Lauren Hill, just even as an entry point in terms of her actually reading his text and applying it to modern um, times in, in terms of the, the impact of white supremacy in Africa. So I would almost say that that's a very intro to um, France Fanon. You know, what I think is interesting is if we put both of your ideas together, I think we'd come up with something very, very, very powerful. Uh, and it gets us to a much better place than where we find ourselves today. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Afia and Billy Shaka, Mr. Tariq Nasheed, thank you so much for joining us on our pleasure. To Tariq Nasheed and Dr. Afia and Billy Shaka, thank you for joining us on The Movement. And to you, our viewers, Remember to follow us on Facebook at The Movement with Kim and Kofi. And remember to join us next time on The Movement.